Uh, first of all, thank everyone for coming and thank you for being willing to listen to me speak tonight. Uh, what I have for you is a very brief and broad strokes introduction to Reformed Theology. Um, it's something I wanted to talk about because Providence is an Acts 29 church, so that means that the elders have affirmed that as part of their beliefs, but it is not required for all members to do so. So don't be worried about that. Um, I just want to bring it to everyone's attention. I know there's people in this room who know more about it than I do, and possibly those who know less than I do as well. So I just want to use this opportunity to bring this to some uh, common context for future conversations, so that when we have those conversations, no one's left out in the cold. So with that said, um, I want to read some scripture for you, and uh, I think we'll bring us into the right time frame, or the right mind set for tonight, and it's from Romans 9. Uh, is there injustice on God's part? By no means, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed on the world and on the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Um, so with that said, uh, this points us towards God's sovereignty in all things, and that's a very big part of Reformed theology, because uh, I think as believers on face value, we would all acknowledge that God is sovereign in everything. So when you start to examine uh, different aspects of what we believe, um, it has certain Merriam-Webster definition of theology is just the study of faith, the study of religion, the study of God. And for our specific purpose here tonight is the uh, core set of beliefs that are summed up and organized by a particular, um, a particular belief. So to give some history, John Calvin lived in the 1500s and was part of the Protestant Reformation, which is when a lot of Christians began to break away from the Catholic Church um, because of some corruption uh, problems, some doctrine problems, um, things that they were doing that people believed was not biblical. So that's where you get a lot of the churches that we have today, like Lutheran and Baptist and Methodist and stuff like that. And John Calvin was a French theologian who uh, actually fled France because it was uh, Catholic France at that time and he was uh, not comfortable there. So he ended up in Geneva and did a lot of theological writings and commentaries in the Bible that culminate in what we know today as Calvinism, which is the same thing as Reformed theology. So if you hear Calvinism, that's not something scary. It's not another religion. That's not a book that you have to staple on in the back of your Bible. It's just a set of beliefs that uh, are about Scripture. Um, so don't be scared by the amount of words on here. I'm not going to go over all that stuff tonight. It's just a, a visual to show you that there are lots of aspects to theology in general and Calvinism in specific. And so um, if you want to research this type of stuff, Theopedia is a great resource. Um, that's where I got a lot of the, the points tonight, and uh, you can look up all these things there. But this is also just to show you that uh, the theology of, of Calvinism is all surrounding the sovereignty of God and how he's sovereign in all things. And so if you hear somebody say, I'm a five-point Calvinist or a four-point Calvinist, um, those five points are uh, make up the acronym TULIP, which is what I'm going to go over tonight. The first one stands for total depravity, and that is the condition of mankind because of the sin of Adam and the fact that we're now in a corrupted and fallen world. Um, total depravity is an easy thing for me to, to believe because I've seen the news before, but it actually goes <laughs> on uh, a little bit further than that, and it's just a recognition of the fact that um, man isn't capable of doing good on his own. Any good that happens is through God's grace, is the Calvinist viewpoint, up to you know, finding $5 on the lawn and having a good day, or all the way up to salvation. A lot of, uh, a good analogy for a lot of these points is Lazarus in the tomb. When God is, or when Jesus comes and says, come forth Lazarus, he's not just a little banged up inside the tomb. He's been completely dead for several days, and he's incapable of helping himself at that point. The U stands for unconditional election, and this is a hard one for a lot of people because it brings into uh, uh, debate the free will and predestination to one or the other, or they're compatible somehow. And I won't go into that tonight. Um, but that's where you get that, and it's a good point to bring up that all these points have a counterpoint in another form of theology. There are debated issues that you will hear people argue about, even in our church, but we do so uh, out of love, not out of, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. But unconditional election points to the fact that, like it says in Ephesians, God chose uh, who would be his people before the foundations of the earth. He chose us. And it's unconditional because it doesn't have anything to do with anything we did or anything about ourselves. 
but he can choose us as many as he wants to. So when you see the elect referred to in the Bible, that's what it refers to. Limited atonement is um, just a natural follow-up for that. It means since the elect are already chosen um, at the beginning of time or before creation or however you want to phrase it, um, God knows who the, the saved people are going to be. So when the sacrifice on the cross was made, um, that was made for specific people and because he already knew who that would be. And, it, and like in the verse here, it says in John, uh, the Son gives life to him he will. The I stand for irresistible grace, and that's just a simple concept of once God has decided that you're going to be saved, that's going to happen. You're not going to prevent that from happening. No one can prevent that from happening to you. So, um, hey, TJ, yeah. it's not an ongoing week report. Just stop. Is it? Is it like a length issue? Or? Speak the truth. Okay, you may need to go to the next one. Okay, well, you're still going. Right. I'm going to keep going. I've got to hurry before I get to. Okay, so here's this little grace. It points to the fact that once we... Uh, once God decided we're going to be saved, that that's going to happen, then they can prevent that. Perseverance of the saints is the last uh, letter. It stands for P. And that means once you're saved, you're always going to be saved. Um, it says in uh, John, no one can take us out of the Father's hand. Um, and I want to contrast that with fire insurance. Because you'll hear people say fire insurance, and that means uh, people who think, well, I said this special prayer when I was nine years old, and so now I can go and live whatever life I want to and do whatever I want to because I'm always saved. That would be an indication from this viewpoint of uh, not true salvation. Uh, it's not to say that Christians can't stumble, but um, it's, it's an attitude and a heart issue. But he uh, lets us know that we can rest in God's grace and he will always pull off. And so lastly, I want to end with a quote by Charles Spurgeon um, that's something that we can rest on. And he says in one of his sermons, It is mercy indeed when God saves a seeker but how much greater mercy when he seeks the lost himself. So that's very comforting to me to know that, you know, before we ever even try to seek God, he's already seeking us. And uh, I think we can all, we can all say that. Amen. Amen. And thank you for, thank you for listening. We're all still here. <laughs>